So hello, we are here today with Susan Greenfield from um, from Neurobio Limited. Um, how are you today, Susan? Um, getting better as the temperature's going up, but it's a bit cold outside. It's a bit chilly this time of year, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so going to go through a few questions, going to ask you a few questions about your business and your journey. I thought it would be a great way to start is if you could sort of share with us uh, what it is that you do, what services your business offers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm the CEO and founder of Neurobio Limited, and we are a biotech company pioneering a completely different approach to Alzheimer's disease. Now, as you might imagine, uh, that I don't have to make the business case for why I get up in the morning, because this is the biggest unmet clinical need of our time with increasing numbers of people diagnosed and even worse, the carers um, who feel that they've lost the person even though they're still breathing because they no longer remember who they are. So I don't think, I think everyone has probably got someone who suffers from Alzheimer's. So um, it's, I don't have to really go into why it's such a devastating condition. Um, what we are pioneering is a two pronged approach, which is an early stage diagnostic that hopefully could pick up that the problem was underway before you presented with the symptoms. So one of the problems has been to date that in Alzheimer's disease, for 10 to 20 years, the brain cells are slowly dying, but you don't know it. So David, you and I, heaven for friend, could be in that situation now and we wouldn't know. Yeah. So by the time you present to the doctor with confusion and memory loss, you're kind of closing the door after the horse has bolted because it's, um, it's much later on. So that's one of the reasons why the current medication isn't very effective. Um, so what we need is an early stage pre-symptomatic biomarker and we think we have got a way of developing that and then imagine if in that 10 to 20 year window you also had a drug that actually worked in stopping any more cells dying so you could go to the doctor and he says oh, there's good news and bad news the bad news is i'm afraid you've got pre-symptomatic alzheimer's but the good news is we now have a drug that stops any more cells dying so take that drug now before you get the symptoms and then you'll never get the symptoms so our dream is this two-pronged approach of a pre-symptomatic screen and diagnostic accompanied by eventually a drug that actually works, unlike other drugs on the market at the moment. This one would actually stop any more cells dying, which means if you took it routinely for the rest of your life, but people take medication for the rest of their lives, then that would mean you would never get the terrible signs of, of uh, confusion and memory loss that has, has devastated so many people's lives. So that's what we do. Um, and that's all because it's founded on a very novel idea of how Alzheimer's actually happens. No one else has actually come up with a description of how and why Alzheimer's does what it does in the brain. But we think we have. Um, and we have now um, four, 20 patent families covering 14 different assets over this. Been going for 10 years. Um, we're still very much at the research stage, but we're starting to realize a small amount of revenue now on a collaboration with a a multinational, I won't name, um, on a sort of um, non-core asset, which is a result of uh, our basic discoveries. Wow, you're right. And that's an amazing purpose for a business. And mm. it's, a, you know, it's a very compelling reason, like you say, mm. to get up every morning because, yeah. you know, Alzheimer's and dementia and things is touching so many people's mm -hmm. lives at the absolutely. moment. Really, yeah. really well. I, yeah, absolutely. So, and you're looking at developing something that's sort of like, so rather than treating the cause with a medication, it's looking at getting it early to be able to sort of... I mean, it's, it's both. It's at the moment, um, the, the great fashion are for drugs that combat something called amyloid. Right. These are antibodies to this. Now, amyloid um, is in the brain of Alzheimer's. You can see it post-mortem, but it's much later on. So it's a later stage marker. And so although you might have a drug that actually can combat that, it's too far downstream. It's too, so yeah. you're looking at a consequence, not a cause, yeah? Um, and moreover, um, in order to have this drug, you have to go to hospital for the day, you have to have an intravenous infusion, which is stressful and expensive and there's side effects. So it's not really the answer and actually it only slows things down. It doesn't actually stop the progress of the disease. So that's why it's important. Well, we, we're very excited about our drug, which has been approved um, as truly novel by the MHRA. We've got something called a passport of innovation, which means that they acknowledge it's a novel approach. Now, that's not to say we can give it to people yet because we have to go through all the regulatory yeah. phases for the next year or two. But that's the first step that it's been at least formally acknowledged as being a new approach. Wow, it's pretty exciting stuff. Mm. And, and Neurobio Limited is clearly, it's a business. So whilst yes. working on that, on that sort of really fantastic project, yeah. Absolutely. There's still a business to, 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 to run and things like that. So from a business perspective, mm -hmm. what would you say your biggest learnings have been <laughs> since you began? Okay, so um, 
I never woke up in the morning and decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never thought I'd be the CEO okay. and founder of a biotech because I started life and thought I would continue life as an academic. So what happened was um, at school, I hated science and I did Latin and Greek and ancient history and maths as my A-levels. And then I went up to Oxford University a thousand years ago um, to do philosophy, yeah. um, changed to psychology and got rather disillusioned with both those things. So changed again to physiology and then... Um, my tutor thought it'd be a laugh if I was a scientist. So she dispatched me to the professor of pharmacology uh, to do a doctorate. And he said, the equivalent of, um, have you heard of Shakespeare? He said, uh, do you know what a millimolar solution is? And I said, frankly, no. And he said, never mind. You can tell us about Homer in the coffee breaks. And so <laughs> it was, I, I have to flag that story because I think it flags that you shouldn't just tick boxes. You should look at how enthusiastic and motivated people are um, and how curious they are. And I, I'm very grateful that I did classics as it is, Latin and Greek initially, because it meant that you challenged dogma, you asked big questions um, in a way that perhaps you wouldn't had you had a very conventional, I've had a great conventional scientific training. So I did my um, DPhil, my doctorate at Oxford as well. I did my first degree there. So I've done all my degrees there. Um, and then I did periods abroad, which you do, which is part of the, the normal career path if you're a research scientist. So I worked in Paris for a year and mm. also I did a, a, a spell at NYU Medical Center in New York. And then I came back and got a tenured job in Oxford. Um, so then got a very comfortable life attached to a college as a fellow where you eat on high table and you know you have the Latin grace every evening. And uh, you, you have the time to stare out through the windows and you have tutorials with very bright students, one-on-one -on -one tutorials. Um, so that's what I did in the nineties. And during that time, because of that environment that was so conducive to thinking and asking big questions and um, I developed this theory of how Alzheimer's actually happened, um, joining up the dots, reading the literature, asking questions, um, talking in tutorials. And as a result of that, um, devised this theory that was published in 2002. And then um, we then thought of a way of combating this mechanism that we had uncovered. And we patented our first drug in uh, 2013, which is when I left Oxford and started the company. Um, but unusually, Oxford University don't have any equity or royalties in the company. Um, so I have the IP, the intellectual property, and I assign that um, to the company. So, um, yes, I've learned a lot, as you can imagine, because going from uh, the high table life of, you know, <laughs> sitting there with the stained glass and, um, and the, the leisure and the time and the silence of, of the cloistered life of an Oxford college, um, to go from that to the cut and thrust of having to keep the lights on you know, and being responsible for the payroll and doing budgets and, you know, the real world, what we could laughably call the real world. Um, clearly that has been a journey and one that I'm still learning, but I've enjoyed hugely. Yeah, it sounds like you're an avid learner and, you know, sort of constantly looking. Well, that's what the human brain does. That's yeah, what the absolutely. brain's meant to do, is to learn, yeah. So and We kind of have a saying in Action Coach that you can only ever sort of earn to the level of your, well, actually, the, the, the blunt point is your incompetence. It's kind of the more you learn, <laughs> the more you grow and things yeah. like that. So it's an interesting point you mentioned about having the time to look out the window and having the time yeah. to sort of think about the big questions. It's quite often a big challenge for business owners because they become so busy. Absolutely. How do you balance your personal time with um, the demands of the business sure. and the space? Yeah. Um, I suppose I'm fairly typical. Well, I'm, I'm not unusual in the following, which was post-COVID, um, I changed to hybrid working. So as you can see, I'm, well, you can see this is my home. Mm. Yeah? Um, instead of being in the office lab five days a week, I changed to being there three days a week and working from home and or being at meetings in London two days a week. So Tuesdays and Fridays, um, because I'm also in the House of Lords, I need to go up there from time to time and quite often meeting investors. It's best to meet them in London anyway. So as well as from working at home and doing Zooms and so on um, at home, then one of those two days is spent in London. So in a way that's really helped because it gives me breathing space away from the cut and thrust of the lab. So I'm there three days a week. So I know enough to know the mood music and how people are and to have the water cooler moments and all the rest of it. But by the same token, um, I have time away to step back um, and you know just reflect on things. Um, time off, work-life balance is something, a phrase I really don't like because as someone once said, do what you love and you'll never have to work again. Yeah. And in a sense, I don't feel I'm working. So. You know, the idea of taking time off, you know, not working, taking a break, I find rather rather sad, actually. If you have to take a break from something, then obviously it, there's something not quite right. Yeah. So for me, um, it, I just carry on doing things continuously, you know, and it's yeah. just part of life. You know, 
uh, the same as playing squash, the same as going for a run, the same as going for a drink, the same as shopping. It's all part of what you do. You know, I don't personally, I, I know that's a huge privilege and many people watching this probably um, might say, well, it's all right for her. You know, I've got to get up in the morning. Okay. and I But you know, I know that is a privilege in my dream world. If I ruled the world, it would be to create an environment or a society where everyone felt that they loved what they were doing and they found their niche in whatever it was, you know? Yeah, I think I think you know, you, you you're right. I mean, being that entrepreneur, being a business owner, you you, you can't switch off the same no, way. Switch off there. Yeah, it's kind of always. <laughs> you don't do your emails part. for a day. They're there. They don't go away. <laughs> it's, well, it's just, part of who you are as well, isn't it? It's become, it becomes part of who you become. So having that oh. ability to keep enjoying it and keep for some business owners, let's face it, are in a position where they don't enjoy what they're doing anymore, but can't get away from it. Well, that's that's sad. Um, so, the other rule I have is only do what you can't delegate. So yes. I have a great assistant and great staff. And if you can delegate something, then do so, you know? And yeah. also when you do delegate, you have to let people have their space and do it in their own way at their own time. I've learned that within limits, yeah? So you don't breathe down the neck. So what you do is you delegate things that other people can do. So you yeah. let them do it and then let them do it in their own pace, in their own way. So it sounds like you've sort of really you've got a real purpose to how you spend your time to create an environment that allows gives you the sort of tools and the environment to allow you to do what you want to do. But you you're also considered in terms of how you're spending your time, where yeah. you're spending it, and things like that. It's really yeah, really, yeah. I'm not a great one for small talk, and Makes I don't sense. know if you're familiar with these color personalities of red, blue, yellow, green. Do you know this Ericsson thing? Yeah, so disc profiling. That's right. I am a red. I am totally Heidi. claret. <laughs> Colored red, yeah. When I, mean, I read that book, um, I don't know if people don't know what to, but but the where people are classified into four broad types, yeah. and um, it was spooky. It was like a, a real character description of me, you know, of someone that really wants things done immediately, that hasn't got time really for small talk or for deviating, gets frustrated if things aren't done to purpose, you know, very directed. Um, so I see that in myself. There's, there's some real power in being aware of what your own pro okay. profile is to allow you to communicate effectively with other types. Well, yeah, well, I explain it to people and apologise if I come across like that. Oh, that's <laughs> what I'm like, you know, here's the book. I have, I have about 10 copies of that book and given it to different people. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so if you had the opportunity to go back and start your business again, you know, is there anything or what would you do differently if you had that Yeah, um, again? I'd like to have started it earlier in my life than now because... Um, I think for me personally, um, I'm better at being or I, I feel more naturally an entrepreneur than I was an academic. And I wish I'd realized that earlier in life, because um, if you're an academic, although you have all that time and leisure, you are very much at the mercy of committees, of university politics. And as Kissinger once said, uh, university politics is so spiteful because the stakes are so low, he said. <laughs> so, nice. Uh, another friend of mine said he'd never seen who's a politician he said he'd never seen horrible politics such as in universities you know where I think everyone's on not very high salaries and so on and so the premium is put on office space and committee membership and power grabs and backstabbing and so on so mm -hmm. it can be a bit of a snake pit and I think um, it's much simpler in the commercial world because it's very obvious what the priorities are and um, what the goals are and so on so um, in that sense I, I, I feel happier in this world. I think it's not for the faint hearted because you're only as good as your runway. And I'm the, the buck stops with me, the buck stops with that. Okay. And, and, you, and you have to live with knowing it's your responsibility. You have to look after the payroll um, and you have to do it, whatever, whatever it takes. And yeah, that's not for everyone, you know, and I think some people can't, wouldn't be able to cope with the kind of low grade anxiety that comes with that, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but um I, I don't mind. I know for me, that's as part of being alive, you know, and doing things and pushing yourself to your limits and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, so in, in a sense, I, I'd like to have had this life earlier. I wish uh, I wish I'd made the jump to the private sector beforehand. Before I did. Yeah, very, very good. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a couple of times about making payroll and paying bills and things. What what advice would you give to new business owners regarding sort of financial management and making sure that those bills are paid? Well, um. Well, of course, it's very hard to do that. Uh, to, um, I think probably it would be to be aware of what the risks are um, and to recruit people who can share that with you, who are not get, you know, who are positive thinking and constructive and can, you have to sort of think laterally. Um, so I think starting, but you have to be aware of what the risks are and you have to be aware that you're responsible and you have to take responsibility. And I think what you do is you have to show leadership by caring about other people. And I think a good leader is someone 
who puts other people before them. It's called the servant leader. I'm sure that's a phrase you've heard. Yeah, and I yeah. think that that's a, a very powerful, powerful philosophy and something in my small way that I try and do, which is to be aware that however um, minor or incomprehensible someone's problems or worries might be, they're very major to them, and you're responsible for for their well being and their happiness. Well, not happiness, but their well being and their contentment and their yeah. feeling of security at work. And you have to respect that. So I think that a new to other advice a new person be aware of those things you know, be aware of those things be aware that you are going to be responsible for people and you have to show sensitivity to that because not everyone is like you not everyone is going to be comfortable feeling insecure and uncertain yeah we talk a lot about being above the point of power which is where you're taking responsibility for your actions being accountable for the actions okay. of taking ownership of what you're in charge of what you've got and yeah like you say, being aware of the people around you because you are what you think, aren't you? You kind of actions, your behaviours and stuff come from your thoughts. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But the, but the wonderful thing about having a company is that you, it's all, you know, you can go. You can, yeah. Whilst, yes, of course, you're accountable, you also can take the credit. You can also be in control. And being in control and being able to make decisions is a very, very intoxicating experience. Yeah, there's nothing, nothing wrong with taking that, taking the, you know, the, no, no, the no. There and, as you in know, take back control, taking control compared to, um, I say, the public sector where you're very much part of machinery and, and yeah, um, large infrastructures and administrative staff yeah. and people telling you what you can and can't do, having to get signatures for this and that, having to wait for certain periods of time. For people who are red, like I am, the red people, <laughs> that, that is. Um, a very frustrating scenario. So this is, yeah. So I think I'd also say to someone, know yourself, you know, know what kind of things you, you are capable of, know your own insecurities, know if this is going to fret you. Because a lot of people, I have several friends who would hate to be running businesses. They, you know, they like the comfort of the PAYE system and having the, the, and that's fine, but you just, you have to recognize and know what you are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So when it comes to team, when it comes to people around you and getting the right people and having the right environment, what yeah. what what do you do and what sort of advice can you give to fostering that really productive and positive working environment? Okay. Um, well, I'm, I don't know. I think I'm still on the learning curve on that. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I hate it when people say they're people people and they understand people. I, I think that's a fallacy. You know? One is tempted to judge people on first glance, but that, of course, can be an error. Um I think once you have appointed someone, as I say, you, they have to know exactly what you expect of them and you have to then give them the space. So if I take my my assistant, um, every morning we meet and we have what we call the stuff list. We go through all the different things, the red are urgent things and then things in bold are next and then pale black are things where we're waiting to hear. But once we've gone through that for the day of all the things that need doing, and I, I leave her to it, yeah, to just get on with it. Um, obviously we communicate, but she can then go through that list in her own way at her own pace and deal with it as she likes and edit it accordingly. So that's an example of how I think it's important that once you task someone with something, let yeah. them do it. Don't keep you know picking it up and you know, picking the stone up and inspect it. You just let and agree on deadline. And the other thing that I find very important is you have to let people know what you're doing. So and I try and instill that ethic, you know, that um if you're going to be late, if you can't do something, if there's going to be a problem, say so immediately. Don't just leave people. You know. I think the worst thing is people don't know what's happening or don't know. Yeah. So yeah. even if it's bad, let people know what's happening. That's the other. Yeah. The other thing we do, and we're a relatively small company, so we can, is have a meeting every Monday morning with croissants, croissants and coffee at nine nice. o'clock on Monday morning, where no, where everyone is there. Every single member of the team is there, the administrative side and the scientists, everyone sits together and we go through what's happening that week, problems we've had, visitors we have, who's away and so on. And it only lasts about half an hour, but I think that's really important because everyone says a team and everyone can speak. It's a because we're small enough. There's only about 18 of us, so it's small enough just to have a, a chat. But I think that and if I'm not there, it's chaired by my number two. So that okay. is something that's cast in stone. Nine o'clock. So the team night. meetings, yeah. the, the purpose of the team meetings, the team meeting happens whether you're there or not. And, Absolutely. And, it's nine yeah. o'clock on Monday morning. A safe environment. To, that's to, right. To where you talk yeah. and you just go and yeah. people know what's happening. Really and as I say. I think people feel empowered if they know and they understand what's happening, you know, even if they're not part of it, they know what visitors are coming, they know what issues there are. Um, so, you know, they're not left in the dark. They don't feel non-acknowledged. I think people like to feel acknowledged, yeah, and, and accounted for. And by having a meeting like that where everyone can speak and everyone's, you know, as much as one can, as transparent as you can be, people feel part of that. 
Yeah. Kind of goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that sense of belonging, that sense of oh, you know, very much. being part yeah. of something. Yeah. So but also people don't think that things are happening behind their back or in the dark, yeah. you know? And and also it gives people a feeling of significance rather than thinking, oh well, you know, um if they're bottom of the food chain, you know, they don't have to know this or that. I think that's insulting. And I think that everyone, you know, has their part to play and we're all, all and we have I hope a kind of flat structure. I try and encourage that as well. Very good. Mm. Sounds sounds amazing. It's very inspirational. Where would you see yeah. yourself in the next five years? And, and if you oh, got okay. some words oh, of advice yeah. to business owners looking yeah. to grow, what? Yeah. So um, at the moment, uh, we're still very much research based. Well, we've got mm. tiny revenue coming in from this multinational I mentioned, very tiny, minuscule amount of money for a side a side project. Um, at the moment, we're negotiating um, a double digit um, investment, a millions, a ten million pound investment, nice. um, which will take us two years, and that. If this all goes to plan, within the next year, we should have a prototype of a lateral flow test for pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's, a prototype, one that then has to be tested. And we should also, I hope within two years, have qualified the regulatory steps you need to do phase one clinical trials in humans of the drug. Phase one is just to test there's no side effects. It's not, yeah, that's just the start. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'd like in two years time to have a lateral flow test that we're testing and developing and to be in phase one clinical trials. Um, and meanwhile, we have a pipeline of other drugs, you know, that intercept this mechanism in different ways. Um, and I'd like to therefore um, be with 20 million and, um, you know, obviously with an expanded staff um, and on our way as pioneering a new approach to Alzheimer's. Very nice. Well, I've got no doubt that you'll you'll get there and you'll do <laughs> what you need to do to, to do that. Yeah. So there's probably one last question which mm -hmm. I like to ask, which is probably the question that I've probably missed so is there anything that i haven't asked you that i should have asked you um you've actually what what you've skirted around as the elephant in the room is um the issue of being a woman entrepreneur and a woman ceo in biotech and do i have issues with that perhaps you've done that out yeah. of complete yeah. <laughs> but i'm having I have, uh, because i think there is some an issue you know and i think certainly in biotech which is a very male dominated sector um that one, uh, I'd rather have that out in the open and just see if people are, you know, there are issues for them, if, they, if there are prejudices or if they see me in a different way to how they would see a man, yeah? Um, yeah. And I think the more women entrepreneurs we can have, half of neurobio female, which is great. And okay. incidentally, um, about two thirds of us, well, of them, only have English as a second language. So we're very, we we're, we're pride ourselves on our diversity and also, and I think those things are very important actually for making a very, stimulating environment and i think the ideal is roughly half men half women that is the perfect yeah makeup and often that's not the case so i just wanted to flag that the people should be mindful and having diversity as well means people are coming from different cultures they have different mindsets and having different languages means they think in different ways so yeah. it makes for a much more vibrant environment where people are curious and challenging in a way they wouldn't be if everyone spoke english and everyone was a white man, you know, uh, it would be a very different so, world. So what words of advice or support would you give to those budding entrepreneurs that, you know, the, the, the women entrepreneurs that want to step into that world, but have got a bit of that imposter syndrome or a bit of fear? Oh, around? totally, yeah. Well, I'm afraid you just have to be as good as you can be and just try and ignore the fact you're a woman. Just press on. You, know? <laughs> you just have to do it. You know, there's no point in seeking, being a victim or moaning about it. You just deal with it, you know, and frankly... The other thing I would advise is if you do feel a man is patronizing you or bullying you, you face them down by telling them to their face in front of people. That's how you feel. And that, yeah. The other trick I've learned from my mum is you laugh at them, which is even worse. Right. <laughs> That's a nuclear <laughs> option. That's a nuclear <laughs> option. So I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> Use it sparingly. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't do that. But, um, or yeah, just know if there are women watching, know that we are a growing number. And um, thankfully, we live at a time compared to when I was a student, when um, the kind of behaviour that has fueled the Me Too movement is no longer tolerated, thankfully. Yeah. But still, you have to you have to combat this sort of natural bias that people have sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Pleasure. Um, very inspirational. So where where would our listeners go if they wanted to reach out, support you in some way? Oh, I'd love to talk to them. Yeah. Them so we have a website. Yeah. Neuro, N E U R O hyphen B I O dot com. So www.neurobio.com. Um, and uh, that'd be, and that's all the all the phone numbers and, uh, and our backgrounds to our work. And I'd be delighted to uh, to hear from them. Brilliant. Mm. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Well, thank you, David. All the best.